All righty. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, why don't we get started here? Uh, October 10th, week three of the class. Um, I hope that everybody has been doing well. Uh, so far, uh, there has been no one who's been hesitant to send me emails with questions or concerns or different problems they may or may not be having, whether they're technical or whether they're about the material itself. And that's been great. I really enjoy that kind of uh, interaction and emailing me any concern or question is the, the best way to, uh, um, to converse with me. Um, I was on the road quite a bit this week, so uh, having the app on my phone was actually helpful for me too as the instructor, maybe not just uh, yourselves. So uh, why don't we dive into the agenda. The agenda is going to look um, like this week to week. I mean, it really doesn't change, just the material does. I'll have any updates or announcements, um, which I'll give in just a minute. Um, I'll review the course notes from the previous Monday's posting, and uh, probably give a little bit of a preview as to what's coming up so people can sort of expect uh, what will be happening. Um, I'll give updates uh, from group work. Um, that there is uh, anything that's happening with our group work and we've really just started uh, the group work this week with uh, the um, the issue that I proposed the potential organizing campaign scenario that I posted under the campaign headquarters we'll talk about that tonight uh, the um, questions from students any questions that you may have and I'll explain the method that we're going to use to have your questions uh, for me and that everybody else can see them as well and then uh, the good and welfare, if we have some time at the end, um, there are just a couple of, uh, one thing that I have, and if you all have anything, um, you'll be able to type that in as well. Um, and at the very end, there's going to be a two-question um, survey um, that will happen automatically when you sign off um, so that you can, if you can just take a minute and answer those, just real quick questions, just to make sure that these are effective and helpful for all of you. Uh, into the future, so uh, that'd be great. Um, so let's dive into it. Um, same thing, so with your um, question function that you have on your navigation bar, um, if you look down your navigation bar, you'll see the word question with a little plus in front of it, and if you click on that plus, just to the left of it, a little panel will pop open, and there will be a place for that you can type in. And with that typing is what I'd like you to use um, to type me a question uh, when you have a question. It'll identify who you are, um, so I'll know who you are, and I'll, I'll get to the question when I have a break in the action or when I'm done um, with a natural pause in the presentation. Um, if you could keep it brief also, um, if it's you know just a question so that you could just keep it to a simple sentence, that would be great, and that will give us more time to um, answer the question. And I'll, like I said, I'll see it and I'll, I'll read it to the group. All right, so let's dive into the course notes for this week. Okay, this is going to be a pain. Uh, Pat, just hit the bottom that says keep the current code. There you go. It won't show up again. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. So uh, communication skills for organizing was the theme of the course notes. Um, and I can't put enough stress on the importance of good communication, whether it's in person, whether it's in writing, whether it's electronic, over the internet, um, even with the other side when you're dealing with management. Clear, concise, professional looking communication is really, really important. Um, you always want to have a positive note when you're talking with the members, even with management at times, if there's, a, not at times, but <laughs> even with management, um, depending on your scenario, um, just to put your best foot forward to show the union in a positive light to the membership or the potential membership is really important. Um, but organizing, good communication skills for organizing is critical for success. Miscommunication or poor communication that the other side can take advantage of um, or can just be a mistake in communication that something was put in a newsletter or on a website in error it missed editing, and I've, I've done that where it went through past three or four eyes, you know, different sets of eyes, people reading over the materials, and there was an error that was still missed. I mean, so, you know, don't rely just on uh, uh, spell checks, grammar checks kind of things. Uh, take, let a human take a look at it. Read it out loud, because that gives you a better spin of does that make sense as I'm hearing it, as I'm reading it. 
Uh, I've done that before as well. But it can set back a campaign. Um, just trying to backpedal and it, it can raise issues of credibility if your message is not clear, if it's not correct, if it's not uh, succinct, et cetera, it can, it can be a problem. Um, learn to speak in front of people. So there's an example I have. Uh, uh, my, the union I work for, uh, NYSET, um, had a, an organizing institute uh, back in the early 2000s that went for about three years. And it was an attempt to get us back on our organizing game and to try to get potential volunteer organizers that would work with the staff organizers and they would do a four-day long training that would put them through a myriad of uh, scenarios so that they would know how to deal with scenarios and think on their feet a little bit better and know the union's message uh, much clearer. One of the things we did was we had people do mock door knocking campaigns and that's, you know, it, it, that's where you knock on a potential member's door or even a member's door if you uh, want to have home visits. Um, and you have a face-to-face -face conversation, or it can happen outside of the workplace where you have a face-to-face -face conversation. Well, a lot of people don't know what they look like, and they don't know what they sound like, so we taped them. And we just did a simple videotape, and we taped, you know, people talking, and then we edited, we edited them, chopped down the length of it, so that we could show best practices and areas to work on the next day. It was a positive critique of the work. But it's very simple to do, and anybody can do it anymore with, um, a simple cell phone or an inexpensive video camera on a tripod and just set it up and tape it and then play it back just so that people can see what they look like and what they sound like because they don't always know that. So one of the people I did this with was a brand new staffer for one of our affiliates, um, one of our teacher locals. And she was at that time in her early 20s and she, you could tell she was very green. She, was, she had a, a bachelor's from Cornell ILR so she had good technical background, but she just hadn't worked with people a good deal in a very public setting. So, you know, I, I was the staff person who was in charge of that segment of the training, and I said, you, you, and you are going to be the union reps, and you, you, and you are going to be the potential members that will be talked to, and one of the people that I picked to be union rep was this new staff person. And before we got the cameras set up, she came up to me and she said, I really feel uncomfortable about this. You know, I'm a little nervous about it. I'm not sure that this is for me. And I said, if you're going to do this business, if you're going to do this as your profession, you're going to have to do this. This is just going to be part of what you do in working with people, no matter who it is, or approaching people that have problems or uh, concerns or what have you. And so she did it reluctantly. She did well. She saw what she looked like. And that was, again, back in the early 2000s. Well, all these years later, she's now a uh, county legislator in the county that I live in, in the Rochester area, Monroe County, New York. And she is the leader of the Democrat caucus uh, in the county legislature. So she's one of the, she's the leader of the Democratic caucus in our county legislature. So I don't attribute that all to that one day, but it was sort of like I was magically looking at a crystal ball and saying, look, you're going to need these skills. And she's in cameras in front of microphones regularly now as different issues come up, along with her union work. She's still a, a, a great union rep. She now works for NYSA. So um, you never know where it's going to lead, but it's really important that people get a feel for what they sound like and what they look like. Uh, so practicing in front of people is important. Taping, it's not a bad idea at all. Learning to write well is really important. And one of the things that I like about teaching with Cornell in this program is that I teach uh, people that have everything from their GED uh, to a PhD and everything in between. Um, and it really puts this type of important education on an equal playing field where it's really democratic, small d, democratic learning. It's accessible to everyone. The thing is, is that everybody has a different ability based on their uh, educational background to write. Some are really good writers, very strong writers, can communicate very clearly with their messages or what their, their point is. And others, they can do well. I mean, they, they can speak well. But when it comes to writing, um, writing is not the same as, as speaking. It's, it's, it's different. Standard English writing is different than standard English speaking. 
Um, so I have uh, a, uh, a lab here, writing lab, that Purdue University has. It's Purdue Online Writing Lab. And it's got the website right there. And uh, I think it's a really good lab. Um, and you can, you can access it with this link. Um, you don't have to be a student at Purdue. And it's very useful. One of the areas I like about it is if you hunt around and, and there, uh, there are tabs on the left side of their navigation bar, um, you'll be able to find out, uh, find uh, where it lists rhetorical arguments for persuasion. That is extremely helpful when you're writing a piece of literature or when you're proposing a script of what your volunteer or staff organizers will be going out and talking with either current or pers prospective members. It's a way that you can learn also how to attack errors in the message that come from management. Um, so if you take a look at that section, it, it's self-explanatory, but rhetorical arguments for persuasion are a technical way of um, helping to explain your message in a way that's very logical for people to think about so that they don't have any um, issues um, as far as leading a message, whether it's in writing or whether it's a verbal message. So take a look at that. I think that it's That'll be a really helpful resource for you. When it comes to talking with people, communicating with people in person, one-to-one -one works best. It also takes the most work. Um, but it is really important uh, to have that one-to-one -one interface. Um, whether it's at the workplace and you can steal you know, a, a couple minutes of time with somebody, although with the NLRB and others will tell you it's supposed to be in non-work times. Bottom line is that everybody tries to steal a couple of minutes with somebody at the work floor, at the shop floor, especially if it's uh, a member organizer who's volunteering in the workplace to form a unit or expand a unit. Or if you have an issues campaign or a contract campaign, um, you have a little more freedom because you have an ex uh, a current existing bargaining unit and you can talk a little more during the work time depending on what your contract language says and what your practice is. One-to-one -one really works best. The reasons are pretty simple. It builds trust. If I knock at your door, at first people are going to be a little apprehensive. You know, hi, I'm Pat. I'm with the union. We're knocking on uh, the uh, employees of uh, company XYZ tonight because uh, we want to get your input into what's been happening about issue X. We have a petition that we'd like to talk to you about that we're getting signatures for, or we'd like you to sign this authorization card, you explain what its purpose is. It, it builds one-to-one -one contact. You're looking them in the eye. You're at their doorstep. Many, many times they'll invite you in the house. You know, there's some safety issues we'll have to talk about if you're, uh, if you're alone or not, if you're in the country or an urban area, uh, if you're male or female, that can make a difference. But you can, you, I'm sure your union has practices about um, around those issues, but one-to-one -one works best uh, to build that trust because they can confide in you. Um, you can read body language. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do one-to-one -one that you can't do on a telephone or over the internet, uh, or in, even in a large group meeting where people, you know, want to sort of hide behind the crowd. Um, it can be a safer discussion because even though they may not know you or may not know you well, whether you're a volunteer or a staff person. Um, the idea is is they can they feel that they can confide in you a little bit more. Um, you can read those nonverbal cues that people give: the nervousness, the wringing of the hands, the you know the looking away that they may give if there's something they don't want to talk to. It can help you to steer the discussion in a way that will help them to open up a little bit if you can read those nonverbal cues. It's personal. They, they see you. They're with you. You took the time to come to their, you know, wherever it was, their home, their, you know, um, when I was at, organizing adjunct faculty members, members the part-time faculty members, I would visit them, uh, literally hang out in the hallway of the college uh, until the course, the class was done and the students were out, and then I would walk into the classroom. Well, it was usually at night or, or late in the afternoon when it was much quieter on campus. And it, we could have a, a more quieter, personal, safer conversation. Um, most adjuncts don't have offices or they have 
a cluster of offices that they share. So it's easier to talk in a classroom many times. So that was a personal way of doing that. It builds an important concept that I'll be talking about through the course. It builds union between workers. Now, I didn't say it builds the union. It builds union, and that's an important distinction. The union is something that has bylaws. It has officers. It may have staff. It has a building, maybe, or an office space. It has structure. It has dues. It collects money. That's, that's the union, and that's important. It's a structure by which we can represent people, and people can act in a democratic way at their workplace. Union, however, is a more fundamental, more critical connection that a worker has between uh, themselves and their fellow worker. So we've heard this concept of solidarity, and every once in a while they'll hand out song sheets and we'll be singing Solidarity Forever. It has a different meaning for us today than it did 100 years ago. Um, but the idea is that connection, that solidarity between workers, that you're, we, you are in this and I'm in this for the same reasons, for the same struggles, you know, to put bread on the table, to have our kids have a better life, to have a safe working place, to have a voice in what happens at work, uh, to be treated fairly and with some dignity, all those kind of things are that union between workers. That's where I think I've learned as an organizer um, or just as a, a staff representative who wasn't formally doing organizing, although you're always doing organizing, you really want to focus on building that union between workers. And that's really where I think rather than get caught up on, okay, the treasurer report for this week, Sally will be reading that off. Hey, do I have a motion to approve the treasurer's report? Okay, do I have a, you know, all that kind of stuff that, makes people just glaze over. It's important and you have to do it, but can you put as much time in a membership meeting, at a, an organizing meeting, uh, at the doorstep, at the workplace with the potential members or the members, building union between workers? So think about that, about how that might work in your workplace, whether it's a, a correctional facility, a healthcare facility, whether you're public or private sector, really doesn't matter. It's all the same thing as how do you build a connection between workers? Because that is the glue, the backbone of any union. And um, think about that you know, over the next few weeks of the course, about how can you build union between workers? Because that's really what's going to make us successful for the next 100 or 150 years of keeping the movement not just alive, but growing and, and, and being more rich and diverse. So that's that's one to one. I really put a lot of emphasis in my campaigns with one to one. And again, they're they're heavy with human resources. You have to feed people. You got to coordinate schedules. You have to make sure that people have maps to where to get there. They have a GPS, whether it's on their phone or somewhere. Uh, maybe you pay mileage for the, the time they put on their car. I mean, there's all those kind of things to think about when it comes to that one to one connection. But it's irreplaceable. Another way you can do it is through meetings. Meetings are good too. They're just different, um, especially when you have a meeting that is early in the process or you're not sure. Remember I had the, the last um, uh, webinar I had about, you know, how people, uh, um, you know, they, they create themselves as a group, but there's no real leader to the group. And then the next step is that, you know, clicks kind of form and people aren't sure exactly who's connecting with who. And then there's more of a, a normalization that happens. That can happen too through meetings. But at first, people aren't going to know who is around and who they can speak to. So they're not going to be as willing to shoot your, their hand up and say, I volunteer to you know, pass out authorization cards or to pass out a, a petition um, at Workplace X. And anybody who can help me, I'll be in the back of the room after so we can talk about how to do that. It's less likely that's going to happen. That's probably going to happen more informally with the organizing committee um, suggesting people that may help and then them being approached quietly, at first anyway. But meetings can be useful for getting information out and how you set up those meetings. And there's one of the, the uh, attachments to the uh, course notes this week was a piece on running effective meetings. 
a good way that you can run meetings are to um, make it so that there, there's not this us and them feeling. Because normally there's a table in the front of the room and whoever's running the meeting and other key people are sitting on one side of the table and then the membership or potential members are on the other side. So it's this physical divide. Think about different ways of setting up a room. Uh, I was having a very difficult negotiations that, with a bargaining unit that had a really bad history of uh, negotiations not going well and the union leadership not really communicating effectively of why things were happening the way they were at the, at, at the table in bargaining. And so I, I, had the, I needed input from the members, which was also new in bargaining instead of a blackout where you don't talk at all. I wanted to talk with the members and get their input about a health insurance decision we had to make. And we had to get this one right because it was a, a big deal. So what I did was I didn't like the way the rooms had been set up. So I got there a half an hour early and I set up the room myself. And I set it up as a circle. And in the front of the circle, there was an opening, and there was a flip chart, or you can use a whiteboard or, or a smart board or whatever you have uh, handy, so you can capture some notes. And then I sat on one side of it, and I asked the negotiating team to sit all around the circle, not together, all around the circle. And there were two or three rows deep of this circle, had good attendance, but what people physically saw when they walked in the room was everybody was together, Everybody had equal access to everybody else. And at the front of the room wasn't this staff guy or a president or a steward or some other leadership position, but there was a device that we could capture the viewpoints and the opinions or to give a presentation or both in front of the room. And that's what the focus was. The focus was going to be the issue or the concern or the problem or the information instead of the people being viewed as the people on the other side of the table, the people you're opposing physically in the setup of the usual way we set up our rooms. It was ridiculously effective. I mean, it, it surpassed my wildest dreams. People were really, really happy at the end of the meeting. We made some really good decisions to guide the negotiating team. The negotiating team was accessible to people because they were all around the room interspersed throughout the circle instead of in the front, and people just felt more comfortable talking. So even little things like how you set up the room can make all the difference to how effective your meeting can be and how comfortable uh, people can be in a uh, setting, in a union setting. Because not everybody's been there before, has been in a union meeting. Some of these people, it'll be their first meeting ever with connecting with a union. Let's make it a great experience. Let's make it personable. and Let's make it friendly. Um, those kind of things. You can check out the attachment for some of the issues uh, about running the meetings. Uh, there's that, that, that note about the effective meetings. Online communications, um, they're important, and I put a lot of emphasis on them, especially now, I, you know, in the oldie tiny days when you had something that were called bulletin boards. Uh, I'm not talking about the physical one, but there was actually, in the very early internet, there was something, the electronic bulletin board. And that was like, wow, that was new and wild. And, you know, that was the new frontier. And now it's crazy, you know, comparatively. Um, but, you know, choose wisely what you want to use on your campaign, whether it's an issue campaign, a bargaining campaign, or whether it's for new organizing or to expand a membership. Um, there's websites, there's blogs, there's Twitter, Facebook. There's a thousand of those out there, the sub-Facebooks that are popping up um, all the time. And you have to think about what works for you. So, for an example, one of the campaigns that I had, one of the very early campaigns that we were using the internet pretty heavy, um, one of the things we did was we would send an email out to the members that we knew of, their home emails that we were able to collect from them. We pushed out a message that would drive them, ideally, to a resource that would be on our website. Then Within the next three days, we looked at the website data, the, the uh, details of who checked in, who didn't, how many people looked or clicked more than once uh, on the site to look at more details, who didn't, not specifically who. Now you can find out exactly who, uh, but back then we didn't have that ability. And we would take a look at the metadata, I mean, the kind of stuff you've heard with 
the NSA. I mean, looking at the metadata, the, the details of who, you know, how, how many people are clicking, how many aren't, how many are looking at the message. And there were times when we found out that people weren't looking at the website and other people were. Well, that gave us a lot of input into where we should direct our resources. And the, the resources that you have, whether it's at a local or at an international or the AFL-CIO or anywhere in between, is limited. You have a limited scarcity. Uh, you have a limited amount of resources. So you want to put the efforts into where the payoff is. So limit your efforts without payoff. If nobody's going to the website, if nobody's friending your Facebook page, uh, adding you to their regular feed or liking your page, uh, adding you to the, your, their regular feed, then you can still have the account, but you either may want to advertise it differently, and that could be an issue there, or you may want to just not put as much emphasis on those issues uh, or on those resources and, and steer them in other ways that you're finding have greater effect for what your outcome is. It's a good opportunity to recruit what I call a new media team volunteers. That is, whenever I negotiate or whenever I organize, I make sure I have what I lovingly call a geek or a geek squad in the room. I want somebody who knows the internet backward and forward, who can create new media campaigns over Facebook and knows the ins and outs of how to get more and more people interested in the campaign, no matter in some cases where they are, because if you have an issue campaign, you don't really care who bugs your employer, as long as somebody is bugging your employer not to fill in the blank, whether it's lay people off or cut the budget or you know, sell the county nursing home or whatever the issue is you're trying to stop or you're trying to promote, um, you just want help. So having a new media team can really help you with the internet. Um, so that can be useful. It's a good way to immediately respond to the employer tactics or to changing situations. An employer can, and they will, take you by surprise. You'll read something in the newspaper that you didn't expect. Uh, I, I mentioned last uh, week that I was organizing a school that I lost by, a private school, I lost by three votes. What I didn't tell you was there was a multi-billionaire food chain in the Northeast that's headquartered in Rochester, and the person that was the leader of that, who's now passed on, um, he was pledging behind the scenes 10 million dollars to this school for scholarships and for a new theater for their performing arts program. After they realized that our union campaign was real and was picking up speed, the next day after they realized that there was a front page story in our daily newspaper um, saying that this individual was considering holding up the $10 million gift because of well, in not so many words, because of the union. They were very carefully how they did it so that they didn't prompt a, uh, an unfair labor practice charge. But, holy crap, <laughs> took me by surprise. Now, we had gotten a heads up the night before. So we were able to quickly put together a message to respond in advance, literally in like 12 hours advance, to what was going to happen the next morning, that the other side uh, leaked something to us without realizing it. However, we immediately responded on our web page, which is what we had running at that time, with what our message was, because our website spiked in terms of people interested in who we were, even outside of the group of educators we were trying to organize. So we wanted to make sure that we had a good message, professional-looking website, good solid communications, good new media team to monitor this and control it. And that piece of it worked well uh, in the end. Um, and the other thing you want to do is always control content. The new media team is not going to act independently. Whoever's going to edit your documents or your literature is not going to act independently. They're going to do what, however your structure is, whether it's the organizing committee, whether it's the overall campaign manager, however your structure is for organizing, whoever that person or people say is the message is the message that will go out and no other. Because this is not time to have cowboy theatrics. Or for somebody to say, well, I just thought this would be better and act out on their own. Because like I said at the beginning of this discussion, uh, you got to get the right message out, and it's got to be the right message, done professionally, done correctly, and on target. Just like you've heard from presidential campaigns nationally, you got to stick on message. Because if you start 
making your message a response to the employer's message, you lost, you're done. Because then they will then determine what the message of the campaign will be from then on, and you'll be playing defense the rest of the way. You have to learn how to answer whatever barbs they're throwing at you quickly and factually, and then turn the issue around to what your issue is, whether it's you know an overall issue of dignity or fairness or wages or discriminatory practices or um, you know uh, not being fair to um, low-wage workers, whatever your issue is, the overall overarching vision mission issue, um, that's really important. And make sure that you really uh, hone in on that. In-person representatives. So these are people who are going to be representing your union in the campaign. Um, they're either going to be paid or volunteer, uh, and I, there is a, um, uh, a, uh, an attachment in the course notes that deals with training and selecting those volunteers um, that uh, I uh, uh, found on the website and I edited it for um, use of union representatives. I think that can be helpful for you. Please take a look at that. Um, select the right person for the right task. That's really important. You can have somebody who is a chatty Cathy and they'll talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, especially about themselves, their experiences, they, 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 they. You don't necessarily want that person at the door. You know, when you're trying to talk to somebody, the kind of conversation you want at somebody's front door is, Tell, how is everything at work? open-ended question. You know, if you were to pick three things that you'd like to change at work, what do you think they would be? It's turning something that is negative. You don't want to say, what sucks about your work? Because you know, some people just turn off to that. You say, if you could change three things, meaning it's three things they don't like, what would they do differently? So you're getting good feedback from them. You know, if, if you could name three people that you think would be great for me to talk to next, who might they be? Now, they may not feel comfortable with telling you, or they might, but the whole idea is you're focusing the conversation on the worker. You're subtly building union between workers by getting them to think about other people, their workplace, their coworkers, the problems they're enduring, um, the hope that they have that things will change. And what does that hope look like? Does it happen through a union, or does it happen through an employer-sponsored committee, which sometimes that happens, and the employer is certainly going to pull that out of their sleeve and say, we can fix it, let's do it together, we don't need this outside third party, blah, blah, blah. We'll talk about that in the coming weeks. So assessing people's skills and their personalities is important. If they really like to do tech work, you know, ha ha introduce them to the new media campaign. If they want to do things behind the scenes, they can help put packets together for people that do want to do the door-to-door -door work. And they can put together, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a meal voucher and the maps, and they can chart out where they have to drive from the campaign headquarters or place where they're leaving from to the workplace so that they can follow a, a yellow highlighted map. Um, that sort of thing that people can be really good about. It's really important to volunteers who are going to be out on the streets for you and for the union. Reps should know your message cold. It doesn't mean they have an answer to everything, but they should know your three key points that you want the worker to go away with after the visit, and they should know those cold. If they're asked something they don't know or, or are unsure of, they should always say, you know what, that's a great question, and I want to make sure you have the right answer. So I'm going to get back to you, I'm going to check, and I'm going to get back to you within 24 hours, and make sure they do get back to them within the time frame they promise. Even if it's just to say, we're still checking, but I haven't forgot about you, that kind of follow-up represents the union very well. Practice scenarios to avoid surprises. And that's that sort of taping the message is one way to do that, where you know somebody who's very experienced in doing visits with workers, regardless of where it is, throws in something that um, may shake up the organizer a little bit. Like, what the, what's the union stance on abortion? It's just like, wow, I thought we were talking about the workplace. Uh, I don't know. You know, it, it could be something very surprising. They're not ready. Or I've had this discussion on the campaign trail uh, in the past in uh, Toledo, of all places, and it was just like, well, my church says X, Y, Z about unions. 
and sort of want you to answer it. And it's like, do I want to go down that road where we start talking about church? Or do I want to say something politely and friendly and positive in a way that turns the conversation back to the issues that you came there to deliver? Again, they have to be practice to the best you can. It's not always going to be a home run. The more doors you knock on, the more workplaces you visit, the more workers you talk to, the easier it gets. But just getting people ready for some surprises and how to handle them makes them feel comfortable, makes the union more successful overall. And again, it's a great way to build union. Uh, just that those training sessions build union. It's a common thing people are doing together. They're uncomfortable at first. They get more comfortable. You know, they have some food, they have some, uh, you know, some beverages, um, they enjoy their company together, they laugh a little bit, it builds union. It's great. It shouldn't be just business. There's also a sort of quasi-social aspect to it. There's a, a last uh, attachment that I have in the course notes, and it's from uh, member to unionist. And it's a, it's a PowerPoint that was put together by AFT, one of our national parent unions, that would, it's a really good way of showing and demonstrating ways that you can take someone from being a quiet sort of back in the uh, back in the back of the meeting space member to coming out and becoming a unionist, somebody who's more active and who is more engaged in uh, the building of union between workers in some fashion. Doesn't mean they're going to be local president or chapter president next year. But it means that you're going to have one more person who, when somebody in the shop floor says, boy, the union really doesn't do anything or they really blew it on this contract, can look at it with a little more savvy and say, well, they had a tough negotiations, but um, let's look at what was happening uh, in our industry. Let's look at what was happening with the economy. Let's look what's happening with our company or our employer, et cetera, to help to explain what's happening from a member-to-member -member perspective. So take a look at that. I think if you haven't already, that attachment is, is I think, a decent one in uh, explaining easily, easy, doable ways that you can help move members from an ordinary back-of-the-room member to a unionist. Um, and that's really, I think, one of the reasons that a good chunk of you are, are taking this course anyway, because you know mobilization is just another word for how do we get people more active and more involved and more uh, concerned in the urgent issues that we're dealing with from day to day? Lord knows we've got plenty of them out there uh, that we're working on day to day. So those are kind of the, some of the, uh, the highlights for um, the group activity, or for the, I'm sorry, for the, the, uh, um, the coursework, the course notes. Um, group work. Um, group work is finally happening, and it's picking up. And I posted a scenario with a make-believe union and a make-believe employer. It's not a real employer. Uh, and I put a scenario down that could be very, very common, uh, describing a local, which looks like a lot of locals out there. You know, they're doing their job, but it's pretty much, you know, insurance industry unionism. You know, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. If you need us, call us. Otherwise, you know, pay your dues and let us do the work. Um, we, you know, we had some discussion about that in the student lounge online uh, um, early in the course, a little bit of exchange about that. And that's one of the things we're trying to work through by working to be more of an organizing union, uh, all of us, than just a servicing union, you know, the traditional model that um, you know, we've, been, we've had for a good 50 years or more. Um, so the group work is, so the, the campaign headquarters, you can see the campaign headquarters now has a flag, got to have a flag. Um, the campaign headquarters open for business. We're actually going to start using that, and uh, you should be looking at postings at that uh, every week now. So know the campaign facts that are posted. You don't have to memorize them, but you can print them out. You can cut and paste them onto a Word document. That's some of the easier ways of printing out uh, some of the uh, Blackboard uh, presentations on the, the Blackboard software. Um, you need to know, uh, so what I'd like you to do, and many of you have been doing it already, is there's a place on the campaign headquarters where you can start listing what are the th first three things that you would want to either know or do, or both, as the regional organizer who has been contacted by the local 500 president. So the idea is this, and the scenario spells it out. 
Local 500 president finds out that there's a chunk of workers that are not organized that may want a union or may present an, a, a, an opportunity to organize. And you know his numbers have been falling. Uh, we'll, we'll assume it's a he at this point. His numbers have been falling. And he wants to find a way to get more money in, to get more members in. Um, so he wants to figure out how to do it. So he calls his regional whatever. It could be a district or a region. Every union has their own political makeup. Um, state office, whatever it is, and says, hey, who's the organizer there? I got a hot tip, and I want to jump on this thing quick. And you're that person, whoever it is. Could be staff, could be uh, non-staff, could be elected. doesn't really matter. You're who gets the call. What do you do? And so what I'd like you to do with that is to apply what you have learned. So what you've learned before this course, if it worked, and what you learned already during this course, what would you do? What are the first three things that you would want to know or do to take a look at the facts you've been given? What, what would you do? Um, the other thing you can do is take a look at your other, uh, the other classmates' postings of what they would do and comment on them. Um, you know, have a little discussion about, well, tell me why you would do X. You know, why would you do that first or why would you do that at all? Why wouldn't you do this? And you know, have a friendly, courteous discussion about it. It's not that there's any you know, hard uh, rights or wrongs, because this is all imaginary, but it's a way that you can sort of start working with people who are organizers. Again, whether it's staff or volunteers, to kick around approaches and ideas. One of the first things I did with my organizers and my volunteers um, in the morning after we were out you know, working um, either a workplace or doing home visits, is I would say, what did we do right? What did we do wrong within the last 24 hours? And I want to know. You know, I just I want to have that critical analysis of how are we doing? What are we making mistakes on? What can we improve on? Um, and you you should be doing the same kind of thing. So that's what are the first three things you would do? What do you want to know uh, or do? Um, and check the headquarters, the campaign headquarters, each Monday for new postings. So each Monday I'm going to be posting two things. One is going to be the new course notes. Those will automatically post on Monday. If you, if you want to know when, it's 4 in the morning, uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Um, so it's early. And no, I don't go it up at 4 in the morning. It's automated, so it, all, it automatically happens. And there will be a new posting each Monday at the campaign headquarters. So check the headquarters. Sometimes it will be new facts. Sometimes it will be things that I would like you to start working on as a group. Uh, together instead of individually, or um, other things similar to that. And they'll be around the facts that you have already with Local 500. So Local 500 is our campaign that we'll be working on for the rest of uh, uh, this um, course. One thing I, I try to take into consideration is what your needs were as far as why you're taking this course, if it was for new member organizing or an issues campaign or for a contract campaign. And I tried to put little seeds of each of those into the example that I left. So there are some issues that are mentioned. There's the potential for contract campaigning if this, if this organizing campaign is successful. Or there was also mentioned um, the feelings about contracts that Local 500 already negotiated, the three bargaining units that I already mentioned that Local 500 uh, negotiates. So there's little tidbits in there for everybody, and I did that on purpose so that everybody would get something out of the example and the campaign that was useful for why they're taking the course. And hopefully that will be helpful. All right, questions from students. So what I need to do, because when that one of the pop-ups came in, um, my navigation page went away. So it's now back. And uh, I'll now put the... Uh, presentation back up. Okay, you should be able to see the presentation in full. Sorry about that. So again, to ask a question, um, go under your question section um, of your negotiations uh, tab. It'll say questions. It'll have a little plus sign in front of it. Check on the plus, and then you'll be able to, there will be a little um, area that you can type in, and there will be a button that'll say send privately or send all. I like you to write in send all so everybody can see your question and it'll pop up with a name and um, the issue. So um, that's what we have. So if you'd like to 
Uh, type in any question you have, either about anything I covered tonight, anything that was in the uh, course notes from the week, or anything about the campaign headquarters. Um, let me know that. You can just type that in now, and I'll, I'll wait a couple minutes if you, uh, if you need to type something. That'd be great. In the meantime, while, while we're waiting for questions, uh, what I'll do is um, let me talk a little bit about what you can expect for next week's work. So there is no reading assignment. If you've looked at the assignments page, there's no reading assignment out of the text for next week, I think the next two weeks. And I did that for two reasons. Um, I learned from the last few times I've been teaching online that there are times when hardworking people such as yourselves need a breather or need to catch up on the reading that's already been assigned because you've either been traveling or you've been out doing um, um, something else other than um, your coursework, your reading. And that, that happens. I, I understand that. We've talked about that before. Um, so next week there will be a good chunk of reading that will be in the course notes themselves. The course notes will actually be very brief, uh, basically a paragraph. But the readings, there will be three or four readings under that that will be attached underneath that. And they are longer studies or uh, surveys that have been put together about um, women workers, younger workers, professional workers, and others. So that it will shed some light on effective ways of approaching these workers to join or participate in a union. And some of those categories are the growing areas for unions everywhere in the country. So we really want to take a look at those issues, and that'll happen in um, next week in uh, for uh, um, week. I'm sorry, that'll be for week five. Week four is next week, so you know you know what's going to happen in week five. So that's why there's no text reading in week five. Week four, you'll be creating an organizing project. So uh, in the announcements, um, there will be, and in the um, assignment page, I think it's already posted on the assignment page for week four, um, there will be a, uh, an organizing project that I'd like you to create. And it's explained in detail on the assignments page. And you're going to post it on the campaign headquarters. There will be a place for you to post it for all to see. And it lists your campaign, real life campaign, or a potential real life campaign that you will be working on or may be working on. Now, I understand that there are sensitivities with these issues, so if you need to change the specific issues or change the name of the employer or not list the name of the employer and just call them the employer, that's fine. But just so people can get an idea of what's happening out there or what you'd like to see, if there was a potential campaign, I'd like you to do that also. If you're involved in a nonprofit organization that does some sort of organizing, they have membership drives, they have projects that they do, et cetera, and you're involved in that, then you can base it on that. That'd be fine, too, because in my opinion, that's still organizing. It's just not union organizing, but it's organizing. So, um, OK, so we have um, a question here, a couple questions here. So I'm going to take a look at this, see what we have. So we have some questions. Fiddling with my screen so I can see everything. Okay, some of these are comments, and that's okay too. I like this particularly to be about questions, though, but that's fine. So, uh, Mike uh, Wendell has in uh, organizing or political campaigning, uh, I find people trust you more if you are with someone else, and that that's certainly true. That can happen, and some unions have a policy of having two people go together also because uh, of safety factors also, so that there's somebody always with you when you're uh, going door to door uh, or work, meeting in a workplace, and that's fine too. The main thing is you have to really judge whether the worker feels overwhelmed by having two people at the door or in their workplace, and the message has to be clear that you don't have uh, a lot of, you know, the two people that are at the door, let's say, both hammering the worker with information or questions. You have to really rehearse that of who's going to do what so it's light, it's friendly, it's positive, it's not overwhelming. Maybe one person, their total function is just to listen and smile and so that they can remember what the conversation was like 
and then once they get out the door and back to your car or back to outside of the workplace, then you can write down the notes. I wouldn't necessarily take notes as the person was talking um, simply because uh, unless it's like they're giving you a person's name or they want you to take notes about something because the person might not know why you're writing it down and who's that going to go to, et cetera. So that, that's a good thought, Mike, and uh, about uh, having more than one person. You all will find that your unions have different policies about that. Okay. Uh, Adam writes, uh, we're a police union uh, with no international, okay, an independent group, uh, maybe PDA I'm thinking. Uh, we have 700 members, uh, which is everybody on the force more or less. There's no room for growing our numbers. We definitely need to motivate uh, workers to become more involved. It's great. Uh, any ideas on reinventing or reintroducing ourselves to the members? I think that's really good. I, I represented uh, police officers and correction officers for many years when I was with CSEA, um, whether they were county or whether they were um, municipal employees and or municipal police department. And also with uh, Cornell, with grievance training I've done, uh, I've done quite a bit with uh, police organizations. Um, reinventing them is, and is an important piece, and it doesn't mean that you have to all of a sudden become different or become new or create a new logo or those kind of more superficial issues. I think you'll look at what works and what doesn't. I was reading a book um, recently that I'll introduce you to in a later um, uh, webinar that, that talked about the importance of the habit. It was about four important organizing habits. And one of the habits was the, import, the habit of organization. So it doesn't mean that you create an organization as a habit and you build the organization. Sometimes it was actually deorganizing the organization. What do I mean by that? Well, the example they gave was it was a Catholic church. This guy was an organizer with a nonprofit organization who worked with religious groups and community groups. There was a Catholic church that was having dwindling numbers, and there were a lot of complaints about so much work, so few people. We need to grow. What do we do? What do we do? We need to get more people involved. So this organizer just looked and said, well, what are you doing now? And he talked about bingo. Anybody who's Catholic on the call right now is chuckling. I'm Catholic, so I get to chuckle with you. Uh, it's the eighth sacrament of the Catholic Church, bingo. So the idea is how much time did that take and what did it bring in? Well, it didn't bring in much money for the effort. Again, what's the payoff for the amount of effort? And what they did was they got rid of it, and they restructured a lot of their committees that they had, they were all set up a long time ago for reasons that people have no idea why they're set up today. So what I would say to, to Adam's uh, question is one of the things you want to do is look at the, the organization you have as your union. Um, do you have committees? Do you have uh, membership meetings? How are you reaching out to the members to talk with them? And what of those that you're doing doesn't work? One of the things you want to do that is a possibility is if you have a solid number of people that are involved, let's say you have 10 of them just to make up a number. So maybe you want to do is say, well, we don't want to overwhelm these 10 people. What if these 10 people talk to 20 people in the next month or month and a half, two months? doesn't really matter the time frame. And they talk to them about the union, about what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong, what would they like to see changed. If they could be involved, what kind of things would they like to be involved in? Do you do anything social? Are there scholarship funds, for an example, for a college kid? You know, you do a 50-50 raffle or something like that, and half the money goes towards a, a small scholarship. Just, again, to show solidarity with each other. What that conversation with these 200 members is, is you may get some of those members who get more involved because you reached out to them. Because so many times what we do is we're busy uh, reaching out or expecting them to reach to us. We had a membership meeting. You didn't come. Well, instead of doing that, how about if you flip that around and you instead go to them wherever they are? So that, that's an answer. It's not the answer. And that would be a great thing to, to post inside of the student lounge and kick around a little bit as well because I think everybody has ideas of ways they can reinvent or reorganize um, their own union. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Mike uh, Wendell also has another question about in, oh, it's the same question. Sorry, you answered it again because I couldn't see that you had a question the first time. Apologize for that. Okay, so um, that's our questions for tonight. Uh, feel free to bring up more as they come up um, next week. Um, 
we're going to move on and uh, good and welfare. So if there's anything happening that you would like the rest of us to know, a good thing, uh, uh, an attaboy, a pat on the back that you want to give yourself or your local, again, type it in as a question. Um, I'll take a look at it. Um, while you're taking a look at that, you can do it the exact same way as you just did the questions uh, just now. Um, you can type something in. Um, I have something, which is I have a Facebook page that is something I do as a hobby. It's just fun for me to do. And it's uh, in, informal labor education news and tips from me. And basically what I do is I get a lot of news feed from a lot of different labor and news organizations. And I find topics that I think are interesting or different from what everybody else is talking about on their Facebook pages. Um, take a look at it. You, on, on the screen you can see uh, what the page is. If you want to, you can like it and add me to your news feed. Again, it's, it's a hobby that I do. It's something I do just because it's kind of fun uh, for me to do. I post four to five times a week, actually three or four times a week um, here and there. It'll be a quick post. It'll leave a link to you to go and um, educate yourself on something else that's happening. And you know, just take a look at, at what might be out there. All right, don't see any more good and welfare, so we'll, uh, we'll close that out for tonight. But if you can think of anything that you'd like to brag about or say somebody did a great job, uh, feel free to add that to the uh, Good and Welfare page. Okay, so next Thursday will be the next uh, webinar. Uh, same time, same station, same day. But what we're going to do is tomorrow on the announcement page, there will be a link. So every Friday following a webinar, there will be a registration link for next week's webinar. So this is an easier way to do it. And it will be on the announcement page of the course website. So it'll be right there. It should be the page you go to first, hopefully. Um, take a look at it. Click it. Register for it. You can register any time between tomorrow to probably the day before the morning of. Um, you know, uh, tune in a little before 8 o'clock uh, at night, Eastern time, um, so that everybody can be ready to, to start uh, plugging in, because I'm going to be starting right at 8 o'clock. Um, and like I said, the registration link will be there. Um, each uh, webinar is recorded and will be broadcast on the YouTube site. We did have a little bit of a hiccup with uh, one of your classmates who wanted to take a look at it, was looking for a password. We've since changed that and made it public so there is no password, so you won't have an issue. But um, I've sent out the, uh, the YouTube uh, site link. Alice will send me another one uh, tomorrow or Monday uh, when this recording is posted on YouTube, and I'll push that out to all of you also so you have that. And that's tonight's webinar. It's uh, a couple of minutes before 9, so we're doing pretty good so far. We're keeping this on time. That's my goal. Your time is important. Um, there's an evaluation that will ha happen automatically. Just two quick questions. If you could fill those out, um, that would be great. That would give me good feedback, give Alice good feedback, and the program uh, good feedback. And I hope you have a safe work week. Um, if you have any questions between now and next Thursday, don't hesitate to throw me an email and ask. I'm, I am going to be monitoring the student lounge less um, because that's more of a place for you guys to talk as students about things outside of the class or just issues that you have in general. Uh, I'm going to be looking at that less and I'll be focusing more on the course notes, your questions, and on the, the, um, the campaign headquarters uh, work, the group work that we'll be doing. And uh, with that, I hope you have a great night and uh, we'll be talking with you real soon. Thank you.